Hello, and welcome to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I am your host, Mr. Miller. This podcast will cover a number of topics that happened on this date in history. Please visit the podcast webpage at thishappentoday.buzzsprout.com. There you can download the notes page, which will help you organize the information, as well as develop your own ideas on how these events change the world around us. If you're interested in hearing more, please consider subscribing so you will not miss out on what happens tomorrow in history. Today is July 12th. In 1999, the World Trade Organization Monday cleared the way for the United States to impose a $116 million in damages against the European Union exports in retaliation for the EU's continuing ban on some U.S. beef exports, according to US, or EU officials. U.S. trade officials had sought WTO permission for $202 million in annual sanctions against a range of EU exports after the Brussels-based union failed to lift its decade-old ban on hormone-treated U.S. beef. The global trade body, which remains without a leader, also authorized, also authorized $11 million of sanctions by Canada against the EU for its ban on Canadian beef, a fifth of what Canada had sought. European officials provided an upbeat assessment of the ruling by a WTO scientific panel and said that it would open the way for sanctions to be replaced by compensation. The WTO could not be reached for comment. Outgoing EU Trade Commissioner Leon Britton had repeatedly questioned the level of damages to which U.S. officials claim the beef ban has caused and lobbied for damages to replace sanctions across a range of goods. U.S. trade officials could not be reached for comment. The beef sanctions come on top of a $200 million in tariffs imposed by the United States against EU imports and approved by the WTO in May after the EU failed to lift restrictions on banana imports from the U.S. firms in Latin America. Separately, Thai officials said that they expected the WTO's governing council to approve a job share plan for the trade body's leadership, paving the way for two candidates for the WTO director general post to take turns in the post. We expect the WTO will be able to find a solution on term sharing by July 20th. Thai Foreign Minister Shirin Pitswan told Reuters, or Reuters, Thai Deputy Premier Supachi Pikavatandi and former New Zealand Premier Mike Moore have sought for the top spot and refused to stand down when WT leaders failed to reach their traditional consensus on the appointment. Supachi said last week that he would be prepared to let Moore take office first. And then in 1933... With a name that rings of bully characters in 80s coming-of-age TV movies, Buckminster Fuller, born in 1895, was quite the opposite. The Massachusetts race philosopher, engineer, and architect lived his life as, well, as he put it, an experiment to find out what single individual can contribute by changing the world and benefiting all of humanity. His way of living resulted in a number of inventions, among them the Damaxian car, a name that combines dynamic, maximum, and tension. The first prototype of the unique vehicle rolled out of the Bridgeport, Connecticut factory on this day in 1933. The car came three years after the completion of his Damaxian house, Fuller's house. It was a pre-manufactured, assembled on-site home designed around energy efficiency and ease of shipment and assembly. His house was an experiment in doing more with less, as was the car by the same name. In total, three prototypes of what he described to his young daughter as a zoo-mobile, a vehicle he envisioned that would one day hop off the road and will and fly about like a bird. The prototypes were essentially the ground taxiing phase of a vehicle that may one day be redesigned to fly. Each car featured a rear-mounted V8, the front-end wheel drive system with a single wheel in the rear that controlled steering and could turn 90 degrees. The design resulted in unflattering handling and Fuller knew it. Without massive improvements by the design, the car would never be available to the public, Fuller stated. When a Damaxian driver was killed in an accident with another vehicle in 1933, it was found the design of the car was not related to the cause of death. That car was later repaired and sold to the director of automotive division of the U.S. Bureau of Standards, only to be destroyed in a garage fire in Washington, D.C. The second prototype is the only survivor of the original trio. Today, it resides in the Hara Collection in the National Automobile Museum in Las Vegas. After changing hands many times and covered more than 300,000 miles, the third prototype was presumed to have been scrapped in the 1950s. Fortunately, there have been two rather faithful replicas produced. 
Though the Demaxion received interest from numerous automakers, including Henry Ford and Walter Chrysler, Fuller never intended the car to be a commercial venture. Fuller had somewhat reluctantly accepted money from a stock trader named Phil Pearson to build the car. His concern about the benefactor's profit motives and short-sightedness led him to add the now famous ice cream soda clause to their contract. It stated Fuller could freely buy ice cream sodas with all the donated money if that's what he chose to do. Following the completion of the first prototype, Fuller used his inheritance to finish the second two. After selling all three, he dissolved the Demaxian Corporation. Fuller later received patents in the Geodesic Dome and Octet Truss, among many others, before passing away on July 1st, 1983, at the age of 87. And finally, in 1984, Geraldine Ferrero was named vice presidential candidate. Walter Mondale, the leading Democratic presidential candidate, announced that he had chosen Representative Geraldine Ferraro of New York as his running mate. Ferraro, a daughter of Italian immigrants, had previously gained recognition as a vocal advocate of women's rights in Congress. Ferraro became the first female vice president candidate to represent a major political party. Four days after Ferraro was named vice president candidate, Governor Mario Cuomo of New York opened the Democratic National Convention in San Francisco with an impassioned retort to Republican President Ronald Reagan's contention that the United States was a big, was shining city on a hill. Citing widespread poverty and racial strife, Cuomo derided President Reagan as oblivious to the needs and problems of many America's citizens. His enthusiastic keynote address was inaugurated by a convention that saw Ferrero become the first woman nominated by a major party for the vice presidency. However, Mondale, the former U.S. vice president under Jimmy Carter, proved a lackluster choice for the Democratic presidential nominee. On November 6, President Reagan and Vice President George Bush defeated the mondale ferraro ticket in the greatest Republican landslide in U.S. history. The Republicans carried every state but Minnesota, Mondale's home state. Ferraro left Congress in 1985. In 1992 and 1998, she made unsuccessful bids for U.S. Senate seat. During President Bill Clinton's administration, she was permanent member of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. She died in 2011 at age 75. In 2021, Kamala Harris was sworn in as the first female vice president. You have been listening to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I thank you for listening, and I hope that you have enjoyed learning about historical events from the past. Thank you to the following websites for their information regarding today's topics. ThePeopleHistory.com The European Beef Import Ban at Money.CNN.com Dimaxian Car Produced at AutomotiveHistory.org And Geraldine Ferraro, First Vice President Candidate at History.org The music used as the background track for this podcast is Americana, created by Kevin McLeod on Incompetech.com. If you enjoyed this information and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing as this will keep the historical events in your feed in the morning for each day. I hope you have a great day.